Okay, hello everybody. Um, today we start through with uh, going through the syllabus and uh, the first uh, um, session that we have is a combination of arriving at reasonable definitions. <laughs> now, there, there are some initial definitions that we have to abandon and then come to definitions that are meaningful to us now. And then we look as well a little bit of uh, the philosophic question of what is success to you? Uh, so uh, uh, quite a deep inquiry. Um, the reading for this week, you, you had that on last week's uh, um, lecture slides as well, um, is as well still up to date for next week. Yeah? We, we start next week by actually defining project legacy, which is an extension of project success. So you don't have so much new reading to do for next week. This is quite a good message, isn't it? <coughs> but again, at the end of the lecture, so there will be the reading for next week. So today, project context, we look at a few definitions why we have started projecting our activities suddenly. Yeah, why, why have we stopped of uh, the good old idea of setting up an entrepreneurial business and just doing what we are good in and improving our material contingently? Uh, or contingency? Yeah, the, why have we abandoned that? Uh, this is a good question. I will try to answer that actually in, in, in the project context. And then we talk a little bit about project success, learning from failure is here the big uh, um, uh, notion. And uh, I hint a little bit uh, towards the temporary uh, nature of projects. And then uh, stakeholder satisfaction in the end, uh, um, why do they matter? Yeah, this is an important question that I try to answer. Okay. So let's start with a project context, uh, or as I would call it in a book uh, 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 chapter, so certainly the curious case of projections. Yeah? And uh, um, hidden in it, the project context, discovery and projection, or getting what you want. Yeah? This is a, a deep plea for everybody. So if we understand this, we are on a good journey towards this. Yeah? So what, where does it come from? Uh, here I have to give you a few narratives so that you will be able to remember that actually. It started really off, and uh, I, I use here narratives, this is quite bad because a lot of my colleagues work actually in the defense industry, whereas I'm not really a big supporter of their narratives, but be mis with me. So re resource constraint delivery is really the first thing that I want to bring to your attention. And here we have a wonderful narrative. Uh, it wasn't really wonderful, the, the context where it was based, but it was the notion of the Second World War. And the British were actually attacked at the time yeah, by uh, planes that, that had certainly superior technology, range, and as well weaponry, uh, um, and attacked on a regular basis uh, uh, England and the UK. And there was one smart... Uh, uh, General, no, he was actually a lieutenant at the time, uh, um, so major ranking, and uh, he he came to that idea that he needed to actually cope with this some way of like uh, a control tool, yeah. And the control tool that he had in mind <coughs> was already developed. It was radar, yeah. It was radar of where potential attacks or issues arose. So this is quite important. So he knew that he was uh, um, technology uh, technologically not really on eyesight with uh, attacking planes, but he could do something else. He could allocate the few resources that he had based on whenever he saw on the radar attacks coming, locally solutions. Yeah? So projections, uh, in its meaning, have the chance of using resources very aimed of solving what we are after. Yeah, so uh, I hope you forgive me for that uh, narrative, but uh, um, that is really where it came from. Yeah? We, we could actually, with a projection, start allocating resources to reach solutions where normally you would just say, oh, this is deemed to fail. Don't even attempt it. Yeah? And, and there's actually, uh, still there are books around this as well, if you're interested, especially with historic concept. Uh, uh, this came from Cramfield. Yeah? I, I should give them really uh, um, a certain credit for this because um, that colleague is quite heavily involved in, in uh, the training of, of uh, the defense sector yeah? and, and military as well. Then there was something else. There was an accelerated delivery. And, and this I accounted last time to the Apollo project. Yeah, it was a race to be the first on the moon. First, it was a race to be the first in space. 
but uh, uh, somebody must have been as well project manager had a hidden answer. Let's not put a human in, put a monkey in, and send him up and claim we were first. And they did it. Uh, uh, the Russian won that game. Yeah, uh, uh, if you if you take it as a game. Yeah, so uh, actually Soviet Union to be correct uh, was the terminology there. Yeah, but uh, um, then the next race was uh, really one that was popular popularized through media even. Yeah? So even a president said, we are taking on the race to the moon. Yeah? And that, that was a whole Apollo mission. That, and uh, uh, if you want, the, um, the many projects that follows. Yeah? Uh, um, if, if you uh, follow it now, where, where are we in the Apollo projects? Does anybody know? It actually uh, finished that program. But uh, where, where did it finish? That, does anybody know? It, it's very simple. It went by numbers. There was 17. Apollo 1. There was Apollo yeah? 17. Yeah, this is a good guess. Because I think 18 was a fictitious film about what would happen if there had been Apollo 18, so it's 17. Yeah, the, I mean, it, it's actually correct. We, we had an 18, uh, which was a handover, uh, but uh, this is quite technical. So 17 was a very good guess, actually. There were actually 17 uh, kind of starships that tried, well, starships, rockets that st uh, tried to start at least from the planet Earth, some more successfully, others not so successfully. But it was actually the acceleration of that. They didn't do that in the classical organizational sense, or they found it as such, but they started actually the projection. And that meant that they could actually, with insights from previous projects, accelerate their project delivery. Yeah, so it was all about speed. And uh, sometimes uh, you had as well these famous statements, our rocket was started one month. Uh, um, there, there, were, there was a lot of hidden time pressure behind it. And uh, again, we, we have quite rich case studies in that. More recently, and, and this is really a, a notion that I have to credit to my colleague uh, who is now uh, at Oxford University, Ben Flieberg, or, or Ben Flyberg, uh, how, how many of my English colleagues uh, call him Rogli. He has written many books, and you will come across him quite a bit. He has actually um, specified that this project, we have a notion of like, hey, we don't need to have a specific environment. I can deliver it wherever you want it to be delivered. Yeah, so this was the next step, actually. It was uh, independence from locality. And there's a huge political attachment. That means, as well, you remove yourself from local expectations. Yeah, so this was another element that was actually quite uh, gripping, in a way. And the last but not least, um, I have to accredit it probably to M&S and uh, I think David Beckham. The desire delivery, yeah. who, who plays football? Can I just ask that? OK, a few. This is good. And I like that somewhere as well hinted, hey, you play football too. I've seen you. Yeah, so uh, um, a collaboration is part of this. Um, does anybody have like uh, uh, nice football shoes? Have you made your own football shoes? Now some of you think like, oh my gosh, he's crazy. What is he talking about? Some, yeah? Who has uh, Beckham shoes? Oh, no, OK. They, they come with a price tag, I should add that. Yeah? It's, it's kind of a luxury item in a way. But he actually states, he puts his shoes like kind of in front of the camera and he says like, you cannot have my shoe, make your own shoe. And then it's basically that you, know, you can put your different things on the shoe, you know, and it will perform then better. Yeah? So there's a deep lesson to be learned in that. Yeah, so it's now a lot more user, market, or consumer uh, specific. Yeah? This is where we have arrived. It's kind of fascinating and pretty cool, right? Well, something like that. OK. So this was a good start. Uh, and uh, um, in, in the meantime, I, I, I was a huge supporter of that, uh, because uh, I have actually a hidden agenda when, when I was kind of born or just about before that. Yeah? I was really curious about exploring the universe and our planet to the deepest corners, yeah, and uh, um, yeah, and and really understanding why we forget a lot of our stuff in the past as well, yeah, the advancements that we had already. So in a way, we have here a, a huge correlation that I will try to show you in this lecture, yeah, uh, um, that that is actually a link. So at the moment, this may be a little bit bewildering. That is quite all right. Okay. What is a project? I'm, I'm after ambiguous definitions. Think simple. The task to be delivered on time. Yeah, yeah, so this was good. Task to be delivered on time. Yeah, or accordingly to the program. Accordingly to the program. 
Hi, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, we have already here business contact. This, this is a proper scheme. Yeah? You don't just have your project. You have actually a program of projects. And it's a task delivery. But good definition. Another uh, definition, maybe. Target and objective. I like this. This is quite literally the projection idea. You know, this is a good good thing. Yeah. 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 Start and end point. We were getting closer. This is good. Together we we come up with a very good uh, definition. I like that. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get the first bit. A unique object. I like that. Yeah. So do you think an object in terms of product or material? Okay, okay. Yeah, this is true too. Yeah. So we, we, we see here already different notions that come in. Um, I, I give you one that I uh, that actually my colleague really liked, and I, I, I was bewildered where he got that from. But it kind of summarizes the most basic notion, which is pretty good. Yeah. A piece of work which is a one-off, uh, finite, but he really meant in in that uh, I don't think finite in its initial uh, semantic sense, or I interpreted it differently with a kind of aim or target, yeah, or, or projection. I did like this, yeah, what you brought forward there. Yeah, that has a beginning and an end. Yeah. This is probably true for, for most projects. The, at some point, this is kind of the guiding line. And uh, um, the, the follow-up question is then, what, what does a project manager do? And I, I kind of stuck to the same literature. Yeah? This is uh, um, now 15 years ago, yeah? so this is quite some time ago. What, what was 15 years ago? What, what was our economic climate like? Were we worried? Yeah. <coughs> that is when we started buying shares. Not maybe all of us, but some people did. Yeah? And they started getting uh, uh, enterprising and uh, quite adventurous. Yeah? So maybe a suitable definition at the time. And then uh, uh, managing a project really meant the overall planning, control, coordination of a project <coughs> from inception to completion aimed at meeting a client's requirement, or qui requirements, plural, yeah, in order that the project will be completed on time and within, notice the authorized cost and two required quality standards. Yeah, so this was probably, where, where would that be true? Is this how, like, let's think about what is a project, a good project that we have as a day-to-day -day challenge. Does anybody cook with friends? No, no, nobody cooks with friends. Okay, this is quite, I can recommend this. This is kind of a door opener. Yeah? If you haven't done that, do it. Uh, uh, cooking with friends yeah, is a good project as well. You kind of get resources, yeah? you, you mash it all up and uh, um, you, know, you mix it. And then something new comes out. You know, you cook it. This is quite good. Yeah, and it has normally a start and an end. You know, and if there are delays, people get unhappy. Maybe not. You know, there are compensation mechanisms, but then you're already advanced in like cooking together. Yeah, but the notion <laughs> is we, we often don't really plan too much. We, we have a plan. Yeah, maybe a recipe. Sometimes uh, uh, we, we have learned it. Uh, a skill set yeah, that is implicit, our tactic advantage, kind of how we have to proceed, is implicit. Control, coordination, yeah, we, we use time as well and things like that. But often we, we don't have clients' requirements. There are expectations with some ears. Yeah? This tastes exactly how mother has done it 10 years ago. Yeah, this is an expectation that is quite high, actually. Yeah, but uh, we, we don't always have that. And we, we don't always have the authorized cost either. Yeah? So we, we have actually fluctuation there. So this is already a company setting. Yeah? This is advanced from the former definition. But I, I have to tell you something very sad. And it, it's kind of uh, outdated largely. Yeah? Um, if, if you work today in a company setting in, in all my three favorite sectors, uh, be it uh, uh, yeah, the, the third sector with uh, NGOs, charity work, um, this, this will probably not apply anymore. And uh, it's the same for um, the public sector and the private sector. Yeah, so even if you look at sectoral or, or the organization settings, yeah, how it claims to be uh, having a private interest or, or non-private interest or, or actually solve uh, or problem-oriented, yeah, yeah, you will actually find that that is largely outdated. Yeah? The, the truth is still within it, so don't, don't get me wrong on that. So what do I mean by that? Project management 
Traditionally, we, we have there a, a beautiful iron triangle, which we romantically uh, often uh, um, summarize as delivering a project in time, in budget, and within the scope. Now, this can be, uh, um, uh, in dip different papers, it's uh, replies differently. Sometimes they talk about quality. Sometimes they have already adopted it, the more current ones. Uh, it's, it's actually client pool. Yeah? So quality has been dropped completely. And we, we had the fin finite uh, uh, time notion. Yeah? So from a given brief or setting <coughs> to <coughs> delivered brief. Yeah? This is a timeline. Yeah? And below, I, I gave you as well the uh, a project life cycle, if you want. So we initiate the project. Yeah, we, we have everything. We are ready to go. We plan it. We kind of look that we have the resources at the right time, and then execute it, of course, yeah? or, or implement it. There are different processes. We come to that in a second. The, the language is quite alternative there. Yeah. And then there is a notion throughout we control feedback on regular times, yeah? see that we are actually up to the projected pace. And then we have a closeout where we hand it over and we walk away. Yeah? But there was an uh, uh, idea in it. We had the integration of time, cost, scope, risk, human resources. Yeah? So getting people in to do it. It's one way of describing it. Uh, then communicating throughout that everybody's up to speed, that they know what's going on. Quality. And of course, last but not least, uh, uh, this was often driven by procurement. Yeah? So some literature. Um, Depending on what, what you have read, if, if you go back to the 80s, project management was actually a procurement, uh, a suggested to be a procurement method. Yeah? So if you, if you would deliver a project by project management, um, you would actually kind of, the procurement would be from there on, they are delivering whatever you want. It was the idea, you have a client, you have a client representative, and he does it for you. Yeah? So there, there were other procurements. Yeah? There, was, there was as well relation-based procurement, which arguably didn't really fit with that. OK, where, where have we moved towards? Um, this is actually the one that, that I favor personally. This is as well why it's in my reading list. Yeah? So this comes from a book that we are using. The role of the project manager involves the management of the definition and delivery of the project for stakeholder success in its contextual focus. Yeah, so this sounds a lot more flowery. Yeah, can I just ask, has anybody worked on a project where you actually had the chance to define your project? The conceptual level, steer it a little bit. Okay, two arms, this is not the majority. Yeah? I, I can tell you now that um, there seems to be like a hidden career path. Often, you get pushed in a situation where you are starting on the former project side. Yeah? on the delivery side. So I, I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, in, in the company where I went at a graduate training for one and a half years, and we started on the conceptual side to actually understand uh, uh, what we are trying to deliver, which was actually quite illuminating to me. But different companies have different um, scenarios behind it. And maybe in your company you should make the case as well, starting on the conceptual side and then on the implementation side, that you know where expectations and kind of the goals come from. Yeah? OK. So um, there, there's another notion with this. Uh, we, we have normally the organizational boundary, which it's based in. Yeah? So this is the uh, explanation of its contextual focus. And there's certainly a division uh, between the inner and outer. In the outer context, the organization is positioned in a sector and an economic and social system. And we, we work actually quite a bit with this when we come later on to the stakeholder management next week. Yeah? And then we have it, the internal context. This is the history and how organizational shapers and respondents have interpreted and in institutionalized their practice. What do I mean by that? That is how people have done it. And if you have a problem, they expect you to come to them. They will tell you how they have done it in the past and expect you to do it the same way. The problem often is with this route, sometimes it works. This is when you are not in a very uh, um, yeah, chaotic uh, uh, environment or business place, yeah, when, when you have a stable economy. But if you don't have that, you can do exactly the same thing like he told you to do and still fail. And that is actually where we have arrived very often. Sometimes you don't even get to carry the project out. So it's quite dooming. Yeah? So let, let's have a look what we have as an option. The, the option is, of course, 
to adapt our project management style to the environment. I showed you this before. We have added here two stages really um, in, in, in this, and this is what we will focus in this lecture on. We have added here an addif additional project life cycle, and we have enhanced it to its all, whole maximum. This is my preferred life cycle. There are other literature pieces that have like shorter ones or, or a little bit unfolded ones. Yeah, I really like that they actually divide the concept from feasibility and definition, that those are three different things. And uh, we will come to terms a little bit later why this is actually quite interesting to divide. But just to talk you through, yeah, it's a recognition that there is an interaction with the business and general environment, that we have different drivers. And in the project, it depends very much where your project is based. Yeah? Is it strategic change internally? Are you setting yourself or the organization and your project management office up for new projects? Then it may actually be a very different game. Yeah? So success criteria will actually differ. And uh, technology is another one. Requirements design yeah, with clients. Is it a design project? Yeah, bespoke for a client. Yeah? Uh, um, then uh, there's a commercial emphasis. Yeah? Are you driven by a market? Yeah, do you go by market forces? Have you positioned yourself with products in a certain market segment? Yeah, do you see that quite competitively? And, and how can your supply chain interact with that? What procurements do you actually have? Do you have like procurement methods? Probably you do. But, uh, uh, so there, there are many notions to look at, and we, we go through that this semester, of course. And then last but not least, how can we actually functionally organize it, yeah? that we have the right structure in place? and as well the right people to support us. Okay, a lot to take in. Um, this is as well where I had the definition from. Management of project involves managing definition, delivery, and so forth. Yeah, the definition earlier, that was taken from this book. Yeah. Okay, different uh, um, <coughs> industries have differently av advanced to this, but actually by now, luckily, uh, we have all arrived there. I want to show you a very contrasting picture, and you have to stay a little bit with me at that point. It's long quotes because they don't... Yeah, I've noticed another thing. Yeah? As we have moved on in that environment, the definitions became a lot longer, so I have to apologize for that. Uh, that shows you maybe as well that there are new problems. Yeah? So this is actually what, what stands CIC for. Does anybody know? It's a very British thing, so I don't think everybody knows this. We have a European uh, uh, equivalent, but uh, um, this, that is a British one. CIC, I take guesses. Construction Industry Council? Yeah, super. Oh, you, you, you come from the construction industry, isn't it? Yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, so it, it's correct. They're an umbrella organization that monitors the industry and gives like intelligence on performance and where new uh, uh, shifts come from. And they gave us this wonderful definition. Traditionally, the project manager should deliver a project to the required specifications. In today's business environment, they have to do more. The dynamic nature of project means that the business benefits are reappraised throughout its life, and the project manager must initiate any changes that may be required as part of this reappraisal. This just means for us as project manager, we have uncertainty at hand. Yeah, so it means as well that we hit actually a res resource uh, um, yeah, price increase on markets. Yeah, something gets more expensive. We had that uh, four years ago with, um, no, actually six years ago. That's again my age, sorry. I always think I'm, I'm two years younger. But uh, um, the, uh, we, we had actually a steel price that actually uh, did a little bit uh, um, a walking route. And uh, quite frankly, this was actually such thing. Yeah, so if you have like a finite budget, this means that you will actually kind of pull certain projects. And this is something where you are reappraised against each other, especially if they have a portfolio or, or program approach in place. And many com larger companies do nowadays. Yeah. Alternatively, this is actually MOD. Yeah, my, my, they, they have the best case studies. Huh? If we come to that later. If you really want to see how, how projects can just go wrong without you even noticing, then uh, you, you want to study a little bit at least the defense sector, yeah? just for entertainment's sake. But uh, um, yeah, they, they basically, this, this is actually, if I'm not mistaking, uh, the aerospace, uh, aerospace side. I should really add that at that point. Uh, uh, I, I don't have 
yeah, n never mind. The, the project, so this is quite long, I read it out, so stay with me. The project manager is responsible to direct and steer a project through the troubled waters of dishonest suppliers and contractors. With the changing climate of client requirements under the cloud of nebulous company directives and with a mostly crew mostly crew of questionable ability and a propensity to rebel against any organization. The project must arrive on schedule <laughs> using only the cash on board at the start and resources must be carefully controlled allowing for all unexpected problems. The pro short break. Yeah. The project manager has this responsibility with senior officers on board who justify their presence by ordering the crew without his knowledge, leaving him with only the authority that he can maintain through the strength of his personality, untiring efforts and unbounded enthusiasm to the cause, knowing that should the project be wrecked due to the quick sense of changing authority, the company will without hesitation hold the project manager unquestionably and totally responsible. Yeah? So this is quite quite dark and dooming. I, I hope it was a little bit entertaining too. Yeah. So uh, again, my recommendation: defense sector. They they have wonderful stories. They are, it's it's not always this uh, grim. Uh, there, there is a notion of that. So yeah. Uh, so um, this was actually a, a project that's, well, that was completely plucked. Yeah. They designed new planes, and then the parliament voted against it. They didn't get the budget. Yeah. So it was all conceptually planned. We have even uh, um, we will come to that later. But we have a plane carrier without planes. Now, this is quite interesting. Uh, uh, but yeah, this, this comes basically when you are in a certain organization. So there are hidden politics that impact at a very high level on your projects. OK, now we have to recover from all these definitions and make a little bit sense of this. Yeah, this is quite complicated, as you can tell. So here, the, the next title is really How Dreams turn into reality, yeah? or, or a, a more uh, pragmatic notion, the project life cycle. Yeah? Um, in, in the past, I, I, this is really more my dream. I, I dreamt of this, yeah? so uh, uh, exploring space. Yeah? So uh, I had that whole notion behind it. And as you can see, I have actually kind of the line of how we arrived there. Yeah? So first it was a monkey, then in the middle, uh, it was a soldier, yeah, or, or a, a, a test plane pilot from the military, and then you you spot that last person. That could be us, yeah, as as uh, uh, researchers and and uh, people that are interested and want to go to space. This was the idea. Okay, a little entertaining case study aside here, yeah. We, we start, of course, in the project life cycle with the concept. And there are connotations to this. This is really taking, again, from uh, um, the book, uh, quite prescriptive. Uh, it identifies who the stakeholders are and their relative influence on the project. And this has become more important today. Yeah, we, we have seen, actually, many projects, especially recently, when, when we come to the later part, you will see that there, there seems to be a determining factor on us. Um, Within that is as well the uh, stakeholder expectations and values that they hold high. Yeah? They identify, of course, the project constraints. This is often a consequence. And investing technical and financial issues and how they relate to the stakeholder expectations and uh, um, how we can actually manage them. Yeah, so there's as well customer and client requirements. Yeah, does, does the client actually try to sell the service? Yeah? And then last but not least, um, from this whole process, we arrive at, well, at the process of defining the deliverables and the achievement. Yeah, how, how are we going to do this? So in a way, in the conceptual phase, we kind of come up with the idea and uh, uh, postulate deliverables, agree them, then uh, uh, initially, then we go through the feasibility stage, which we come to now. Yeah. Uh, here, by the way, I tried pictures to, to um, highlight the concept. Yeah? So how do we arrive at the space suit? This is the idea. Yeah? This was how it looked after the initial <coughs> conceptual design, yeah? where it was brainstorming, what do we need? How would a good space suit look like? By the way, I've stolen that from some uh, uh, computer game. Yeah? So there, there was a similarity. It's, it's not quite that suit. But uh, we, we come to the reality. So then we, we have the feasibility uh, phase. 
And this is normally an initial conceptual stage where you start asking around how much will it actually cost? Can you deliver this? So you go into supply chains yeah, and do the research. Uh, often with feasibility, we have as well other hidden costs associated. So we will actually talk about it. There are smart tools like Pestel and uh, um, other creative techniques of uh, associating value <laughs> with ideas. Yeah, so there's as well value management, value streaming. You will have that, I think, with Claudio as well. That is one way of doing it. There are others. I, uh, I hope I, I can show you the diversity in this uh, semester. And uh, uh, the important thing is investing technical and financial issues and how they relate to stakeholders' expectation and what is most valuable. So we kind of had that before, but here we're going actually down the route of attaching cost to it. Yeah, we quantify it. Then again, it's still the defining stage. Yeah? We, we have to revisit our list that we had there, defining the deliverables and their achievement. We, we put as well uh, cost to that. Yeah? And then last but not least, you actually approve kind of budgets where you arrive. This is not just your team. Yeah? This is important that you go back to the client and uh, to the other stakeholders and look at the feasibility as well in the greater picture. Yeah? So there has to be the communication. This is very essential at that point. And after the feasibility, you, you notice we don't have the rocket pack on the back anymore. Yeah? Th this is actually the presser suit uh, um, that came out uh, uh, from that uh, um, exercise in reality. Yeah, so um, the, I, I want to use here the uh, Red Bull uh, space dive as a parallel case study. Yeah, so this was actually the suit that they went with. This was after working with all their suppliers and going through the feasibility stages. Sometimes they hadn't even developed the components yet. Yeah, so this was as well uh, uh, something that, that was actually ongoing at the same time. This is very important yeah, to go through the notion. There were as well uh, in the supply chains small companies competing against it, yeah, just because there was time pressure to have this particular part on the suit. Yeah. The wonderful case study, and it's uh, um, open source, so you can actually access it. Um, so project, uh, um, when it comes to the definition phase, um, we, we can actually break it down. The design is normally refined, sometimes even to a, a manufacturing stage, in our case not. Yeah. So defining the what and the how of the project with core stakeholders. So we, we are back at agreeing this. Yeah? And uh, um, I, I, we, we come to the agreement phase in a second. But there is as well a procurement phase. How do you want to procure that? Do you want in a space suit to, to write this out? You, you first agree the design and then roll it out to your supply chain? This is probably a bad idea if they are all one-off companies on, and they are actually developing or researching as well how they can solve this problem, then this is a bad answer. Yeah? So, but uh, again, here we define who and how long and how much it will cost. Yeah? So many ongoing project uh, problems and issues rooted in misunderstanding or poor communication at the definition phase. This is very important to understand that it's not necessarily meaning that you have to explain everybody everything. This is like capturing the expectations, yeah, and being very clear about what you're setting out to deliver. Yeah, so this is an important notion. Okay, from the definition, we come then, uh, the, well, this is still definition, this is a prototyping. We actually kind of uh, um, prototype in, in this industry. Yeah? So this was actually just a, a, um, a normal skydive yeah, out of the plane. This wasn't the proper thing. Yeah, so um, you, you test it first from not so high. Yeah? Can everybody recommend it as well? If you want to try flying, try it from the ground first. Yeah? Don't, don't, you know, never mind. So uh, um, along that, in the execution phase, uh, um, you know, you, you work with the definitions. You, you have to agree. Is the definition something flexible? This is an option. Yeah? If you have a client that is very proactive, like those guys from, who, who, was, a, who was a client in this project? Yeah, yeah, that, that was the right answer, yeah? So, national, uh, yeah, no, it, it's, here's a question for you. This is a little bit the joke uh, aside. What is it? Is this astronomic or astrologic? Oh, okay, you did know it, okay. No, it's, it's, uh, it's a pity. I had recently somebody saying, like, Robert, I, I didn't see you in astrologic terms. 
and I was a little bit buffered about that because I never used that word. But uh, um, yeah, okay, there, there you go. Uh, but uh, here are different uh, um, stages to be agreed. Yeah, you can plan and manage it accordingly. Definition may actually shift. Yeah, so with Nada, they adapted it actually because they wanted a spacesuit that could be used as a um, well. We come to that in a second. Returning back to planet suit. Yeah. And uh, um, then uh, the, the control was as well adapted. Yeah? So with control, there's not always one way of controlling it. This is very important to recognize. They resourced it accordingly, actually along the project. And performing uh, uh, was a huge part. And they did learn along the route. So this was actually a very good uh, project to, to study those elements. Then it came to the execution. Uh, had to do with weather influence. Yeah, this, was, uh, this is how he got to the... Yeah to the stratosphere, a balloon, surprising. Not my favorite uh, uh, way of a rocket, yeah, explosive into a shelter, and then you sit somebody on top. Still my favorite, probably, just from excitement uh, point. But uh, um, yeah, they, they did it by a balloon, and they needed certain weather conditions, so there were trials with this. But then finally, it was time. They, they actually sent him up. So he arrived in his little capsule, and uh, um, this was him like just before the jump. And execution, sorry, uh, it's a little bit lengthy. Th this is a terrifying point. So if you do like a, a space traveling and you jump out of the plane, gravity ev eventually will bring you back, but you have like roughly a minute where you don't really know if you're moving. You have no reference points. Yeah, and this is always quite exciting, and I just wanted to give it a picture as well. Yeah, it's just beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, our little planet there. But yeah, anyway. Okay. Uh, then, of course, he, he kind of landed it as well without getting into... He made it exciting. He landed, like, close to, uh, um, uh, yeah, basically electricity cables. Yeah? So uh, if you have, like, um, high voltage lines, don't try to land your sk uh, um, skydive close to it. This is a big rule, yeah? So, um, but he, he, he knew this, obviously, and then, yeah, this was kind of a close, no, it wasn't close out, but basically it was operational to a degree, yeah? so they could then analyze the data and uh, um, decide where they had to adjust it and then close it out, yeah? So it's actually simple. This was it. This is actually the semester kind of summarized. A any questions? No. Any, any questions? No? Okay. Well, um, Kind of all being said, yes, and this was an interesting project. There, there were a lot of hidden issues as well with it. It was actually a program, but uh, I still think it, it's a, a very powerful uh, uh, input. So something doesn't really work out. Yeah? So we, we have that acceleration. We can do a lot of cool things. So let's have a look a little bit at the concept versus what we have delivered. This is roughly how I live. No, well, not really, but uh, uh, this type of building. Yeah? When, when was that built, roughly? Guesses? Who's interested in houses? Late 1990s. Yeah? Wait. What? Late 1900s. Yeah. 1910? Sorry, yeah. Late 1800s, which is the 19th century. Yeah, so uh, roughly 1870 to 1920, this was quite hip. Uh, this was like the, the design you wanted. Yeah, but I, I'm still living like that. What, what is the lifespan of a building? Rough, rough guess? 50? Yeah, those guys still built with 50 years in mind. And uh, uh, what do we build nowadays for? <coughs> Housing? 25. Yeah, this is good 25, 15. Yeah? 15 to 25. Yeah, well, uh, portable houses is actually shorter. Yeah, but. Uh, um, so, so there's a certain implication. It means major maintenance if you, if you uh, um, use today's uh, houses. Yeah? They, they as well build cheaper, yeah? so there, there's a, a certain benefit with it. But it doesn't create the value. I would prefer to live in something like that. This is a personal for choice. Yeah? I, I like the idea of a glass box. But uh, um, not, not everybody's choice. Yeah? So this is what I could have been living in. But do we favor this in the construction industry? Do we build a lot of houses like this? No. It's, sure, it's certainly not on the, uh, uh, that is our cheap price option tag, yeah? This comes actually uh, uh, quite pricey. Although it's really just assembling glass or something like that, yeah? No, but okay, so something didn't really pan out. Do we drive around in those cars? Okay, this is not everybody's taste, yeah? No, no, we don't. Yeah, they, they are around. The, the answer, uh, this is, by the way, a heroic translation. Yeah, think about it. That was a concept, and, and that is what we sold. Yeah? So uh, there, there is a notion here. Yeah? 
Uh, um, I have a reverse, so this is automotive. Then I have the reverse. Yeah? This is when, when I was kind of born. Ah, okay, never mind. So this was some time ago, yeah? And I remember, I went in Berlin to the airport, and there was this, what, what is the plane called? Concord, yeah. Then there was a, what, what was the Russian version called? Ooh, this is kind of, no, nobody knows? Okay, homework. So uh, the Concorde landed in Berlin, yeah, and uh, uh, th this was pretty cool, and uh, you, you got champagne when you got on it. There was two seats per side, uh, very luxurious. Two hours you were in New York. Uh, this was amazing. I, I thought, like, no problem in collaborating with our uh, friends in Hong Kong anymore. Yeah, I fly over for an hour. Kindergarten, yeah. Now I'm here, and uh, I, I show this in heroic memory of this. Now, this is, uh, um, ironically, when I got to Charles de Gaulle, yeah, I, I had a rented car, I was slightly late and took the wrong exit, and you arrive actually at the reminder, you could have traveled so fast. Yeah? How, how fast did they go? Yeah, the, well, yeah, this would be one Mach, yeah? So, uh, it's actually 2,400, 95 kilometers, yeah? so the, the travel speed would be actually 2,000 kilometers per hour. This was incredible. Yeah? So um, th this, they reminded me that that was an option in the past, but no longer available. And, and uh, in, in Great Britain, in the same week, it was in the news. So I just wanted to uh, provide you with the evidence. It went to a museum. Yeah? And nowadays, our fastest answer is this, not necessarily the company, but uh, the Boeing 747. It's the fastest. fastest. How, how fast do we go? Seven, what, ooh, 700 miles? What, what is that in kilometers? Actually about 600 miles an hour, so I think it's pretty much the same as a 747. Yeah, this is a 747. Uh, oh yeah, oh, that's, yeah it's, it's, it's the 400, isn't it? I think about 600 miles an hour. Okay, it's, it's roughly around uh, uh, 950 kilometers per hour, but they don't actually fly that. They normally fly around 920, yeah? So it's not that fast, it's half of the speed. What have we done here? This is, uh, and, and uh, more private, uh, I wanted to give you the option as well. If you don't like to travel crowded, this is an alternative, yeah? Uh, uh, flies as well, just 980, so the pilots fly normally 950. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit more fancy. Yeah? You, you have to organize as well where you're landing, and yeah? you have to phone the uh, uh, um, airport up. So it's a little bit more uh, different. But you know, we, we have not accelerated anymore. We have slowed down. What's going wrong? Yeah? And uh, um, there, there is an answer to all this. It's quite terrifying. This came in, in 1988. Uh, it was actually assessed by um, the DEA, which is um, <laughs> not the uh, um, company that you think it is. It was actually a European forum, and it was led by a, a German guy, and he and the British guy put this report together. And they concluded for projects. The incorporation of new technology in mega projects, and, and they discovered all these things are kind of mega projects in their mind, uh, so they had kind of ambiguous definitions. We will have a different one for us. Almost ensures that the project will make more mistakes than money. The use of new technology is the only factor that is associated with bad results in all three dimensions cost, growth, schedule, slippage, and performance shortfalls. This is quite dark, isn't it? So he, he's, you, you would probably say he's not a great fan of change. Yeah? This is a safe bet. Okay, so what, what does that mean for us? Well, we, we have to consider a little bit what is actually failure yeah? and success as well. Actually, where, where are we in timing? Is it worthwhile to do a break? Or shall we rattle on for a little bit further? <coughs> Do you, do you want a 10 minute break now? Yes. Okay, okay. That was heavy. Yeah? A lot of pictures to take in. Short break. Okay, let, let's get started again. Uh, now we, we kind of like uh, arrived at that quite. Okay, we, we have more or less uh, arrived at the notion that, that failure is a, a determining factor.
Okay. Sh shall we discuss it in an open? Like, uh, if you if you have burning questions that we that are worth discussing, we, we can always do that as well. Actually, last time I, I didn't get any questions. Do me the favor, yeah. If you if you have questions throughout the lecture, write it on a little note and and give it to me at the end of the lecture. I will read them out. Yeah. So this is still my promise and. Uh, I had uh, uh, not a few of uh, questions last time that actually came to the front. A lot of personal questions are, are lined up in, in person, which is fine too, but uh, uh, use the medium, yeah? so uh, it, it's there for you. Okay, so we, we kind of concluded uh, um, that there are many notions of failure that kind of have created on an emotional count nearly a certain fear and risk averseness. Yeah? And that there are deep lessons to be learned if you're interested in uh, psychology or as well um, like our sensoric uh, uh, notions of the body, we actually don't have a sensor for danger. Yeah? We were pretty bad in, in, uh, um, yeah, in estimating this and this is why we invented risk really to compensate that. Yeah? We, we can kind of like warn each other and say like it's kind of dangerous when you're going there, so pointing out risk. Yeah? And the risk averseness, pardon? The speaker, yeah, certainly. Is that better? So um, th this notion of uh, um, uh, risk has certainly led us to a risk-averse society. We come to that later with Claudio, you will have that already. But now we have to look a little bit at the opposite of what, what is actually success. Yeah, I have a colleague, and I come to him in a second, who says, like, success, don't be crazy. We cannot quantify success. And he has a point there, yeah? but uh, um, let, let's try at least. So, uh, what, what is success to you? Where, where did you feel the last time, retrospectively speaking, looking back in time, when did you feel the last time you were successful? Okay, I take the joke away. Just look at me. Uh, th this was one answer, and I was impressed by the student. Uh, uh, but uh, this is, of course, not what I mean. Uh, uh, well, it's a good answer. Yeah? This is granted for everybody. But the success... Uh, uh, what was the success last time you came across it? Graduation. Graduation. So when, when you had the hat on and then the big ceremony and, and you had time to celebrate. Yeah? This is important. Big lesson for project management. In many projects there were a few parties to be celebrated. Yeah? Celebrate the success. Yeah? This is very important. Okay, so the celebration. Yeah? A ceremony. Very good. Something else? Okay, o over the finish line, or when you eventually made it back from South Shields. <laughs> I, I think there are two successes. One is getting there, and the other success is getting actually back. Yeah, so here, one, one was a uh, qualification, I take it, yeah? yeah. With education, yeah? and, and uh, uh, here the, the physical aspiration yeah? of, of surviving the torture of, of pushing yourself to the limits, yeah? So this is interesting, yeah? The, here, here was the notion from pain involved. What, what about the news? Pain as well. Oh, okay. So first pain, and when we are over it, then, then we feel success. Yeah, There's a deep lesson there yeah, uh, in, in psychology that uh, you don't really feel successful if, if it's too easy. Yeah? So uh, may, maybe another notion? The, the danger is we, we do later on the brainstorming. I hope not that this is one of the aims. Let's make it a painful experience. Uh, this is uh, hopefully not what you're striving for. Okay, there, there are different ones. Uh, uh, I'll give you the official first. Project success is the satisfaction of stakeholder needs and is measured by the success criteria as identified and agreed at the start of the project. Um, this is actually still the same in uh, the 2012 version, yeah, in the newest. Um, what, what's interesting is, what, what, what is an alternative for needs? Values. Pardon? Values. Well, ooh, this is an uh, ambiguous translation. I, I think it goes emotion in the right direction, but it's actually not what needs are. What is needs when you're doing the run? What, what are the ultimate needs whilst you're running? Yeah. Oh, I like the, you, you. You think still about space, yeah, being out there and running. Don't forget the oxygen. Uh, the, uh, um, yeah. So there, there is uh, um, there, there is uh, oxygen. Yeah, the, the air around you, and of course water. Yeah. So those are needs. What would have been nice to have? Strength. You need strength. Ability to run. Yeah, ability. Encouragement. 
An encouragement, yeah, okay, those are soft notions, I like it, we, we get here in good Torah. Good weather, yeah. So those are, uh, th those go actually beyond the need, yeah. Those are uh, maybe additional wishes. So what I try to emphasize here, this is already compromised, yeah. It's a focus on needs. It's not really what the stakeholder wanted, yeah? so we, we have shifted from that. If you come with this definition, they go to a different delivery guy, yeah? or, or a different cust uh, uh, product development team, different project manager. Yeah, this, this is an important notion. Okay, other ones, uh, uh, this is uh, associated to famous uh, people, but it's associated to different famous people, so I, I really don't know who really said that. Uh, uh, success is getting what you want, and happiness is liking what you get. So there's already this... Uh, a surreal divide yeah, between uh, um, were, were, were you both happy after the qualification and ceremony? Very, 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 happy, yeah. very happy, okay. And after the run? Very happy. happy. Even happier when you made that back to Newcastle? No, okay. <laughs> that, that stops that. That's a, uh, okay. That, that is a notion uh, um, associated to different uh, uh, um, yeah, celebrities from the past. And uh, uh, here, a very grim one. And, and it's a very big notion in this of truth. Yeah? This is worth considering in a lot of depths when you come to the conceptual phase. Success has always been a great liar yeah, from Nietzsche. And then showing that uh, um, even if you are successful, <coughs> sometimes the client changes his mind, he sees it something new, and in a way you haven't achieved really client satisfaction. Yeah? So uh, uh, there, there is a grim notion of that behind this. Yeah? So success is something that can vary a lot. Yeah, so let, let's uh, have a little bit of a look at examples that we understand as well the notion of success. And I promised you this actually. Um, it's a designer uh, um, that uh, Jorn Utzen, and uh, he won the uh, Pritzker Architecture Prize. And he, he was a very promising architect that just started, to, well, yet need not just started, but he had a few small projects. And that was the first big. Uh, um, competition that you really won. Yeah? So, oh, by the way, I use here a lot of real products because they are even easy to show. Yeah, I have a swell letter on uh, um, a service, actually, in between. They, they make as well incredible good examples for success or failure, but there is often not something to show with it. Does that make sense? Yeah? So it's a little bit more uh, uh, conceptual. So anyway, this uh, a beautiful uh, um, a piece of design that he put in the landscape uh, became World Heritage within the time was built uh, uh, in the 60s, no, before the 60s, in the 60s to the 70s, yeah, sorry, that way around. And then uh, um, it has become as well a city symbol yeah, of a capital city in the world. And uh, um, the, I'm talking about the Sydney Opera House. Um, there, there is a hidden story to this. This is actually it from the inside. Uh, I, I, I heard last time some have been there before and were impressed. So um, uh, that, that was quite interesting to me, because uh, um, are, are there many operas in, in, in New, New Zealand or Australia? Has anybody been there? OK, you. Uh, how many operas or, or theaters uh, have you seen? Uh, not that many. It was, a it was really a status at the time yeah, of, of bringing classic cultural uh, elements to Australia that were before not valued. And uh, um, did, did you watch actually an opera or, or a musical or something? No, I went to uh, comedy. Oh, to comedy. Yeah. Was it good for comedy? Uh, it wasn't the best room actually, but it was oh. funny. Okay, not, not good for comedies, <laughs> but I have heard for operas is actually quite astonishing. So, um, <coughs> yeah. But uh, on, on, more famously, uh, it's probably uh, that. Yeah, so the outside, uh, that, that was well recently, uh, that they had a beautiful laser uh, light show there, and uh, that, that looks quite spectacular. So um, here's a question success or failure? <coughs> success. Okay. Who, who else thinks success? This is good. I like this. We have at least half of the audience that thinks it's a success. Yeah, then uh, I would give it probably 25%. They're still thinking, should I participate in this voting or, or rather see what the outcome is? So uh, we, we can't say a majority is certainly thinking it's a success. 
and, and the, the sad story is uh, uh, hidden behind it. Yeah? The, the only notion that I want to say at this point is that this architect never uh, uh, participated in the competition again and actually withdraw more or less from architecture. This is a lie. He still did on personal request a uh, um, particular project, but that was all local stuff. Eh? He didn't go out in the world stage anymore. And uh, he, he built actually pretty cool uh, um, villas in Mallorca. Yeah? If you ever again back in Mallorca, I don't know really why, but uh, um, he, he built a house himself there and actually removed himself from the public sphere. Yeah, he felt that uh, this project um, well, was a huge failure and uh, had so like. It took 17 years to build. Yeah, well, we, we come to that in a second. Yeah. <laughs> the, so, what, what is that? Who, who knows this? Yeah, the Eurostar, this is a train. What, what is it uh, um, doing? Crossing yeah, crossing the channel. That's a channel tunnel. And uh, um, what, what does it do? <coughs> What does it now do? This is amazing. Uh, this is one of our favorite projects. I had heated debates if that is a success or failure. Uh, success? Who thinks success? Okay. Oh, this, uh, this time we are more indifferent about it. Yeah? So um, there, there was only a quarter. Uh, um, uh, have more people decided not to participate in that game? Uh, yeah, so a uh, quarter think it's a success. I think it's a success. They've actually upgraded the system uh, recently and they have made uh, the journey from Paris to London uh, um, 20 minutes shorter. I thought that was amazing. Then my colleague said like, do you know how much it cost? And, uh, <laughs> and the joke was then, they should, have, they should have recruited the best looking models, male and female, free champagne every journey. And after 20 years, we would have still had a lot of cash left. Yeah? So um, <laughs> he was very cynical about it. Yeah? So this is a bad evaluation. It shows you that my colleagues are slightly uh, have different aspirations, let's put it that way. Yeah, but uh, um, there, there is a big notion behind it. Yeah? So, oh, who, who well, yeah, I mentioned this. Yeah? This is not such a cool uh, uh, photo to show, yeah? but it was actually um, the UK inland uh, um, tax revenue. They, they had the new IT system, amazing thing. Shouldn't even cost that much. Yeah, the, the contractors negotiated around 100 million, mostly hardware, to be fair. Yeah? So uh, they, they had to put physically stuff in. And uh, um, they had never specified what the initial budget was. So that is maybe already an indication where it went wrong. And uh, um, here is the key for it. Yeah? So I've just named the, the top uh, um, four, really. Oh, no, I forgot the terms by here. But, uh, um, so Sydney Opera started off with a budget of 2.5 million, was supposed to uh, take how long? This, this was the right answer, actually. Do you remember how long it was, Sydney? Yeah, it? yeah, it was supposed to be actually two to five years. They knew that there would be challenges, yeah, but uh, um, it took 17 years. Yeah? And uh, um, they started with a budget of 2.5 million and arrived at 87 million. This is not when you have a very happy client, quite frankly. <laughs> Tom's Bayer was quite interesting too. Uh, started off with a budget of 23 million, then went to 400 million. And this is a channel, channel tunnel budget, and this was pointed out basically as an alternative of um, you know, models serving champagne along the train for free. You know, this, this was an alternative uh, uh, use of the uh, 11 billion. Yeah? Um, and then we have the UK inland revenue. That, that was fascinating because uh, um, 35 is actually a lie. This is literally what they had budgeted. This is excluding the hardware. So there, there was hardware as well involved of roughly 100 million. But this is like anecdotal. I asked a colleague who actually worked as a project doctor on this project. And he said it was roughly 100 million. And uh, I'm not quite sure what the initial budget was, but it wasn't that much. And it costs them 3.2 million, largely because they <coughs> overcharged some uh, very wealthy companies in tax and booked it. So this is a very bad idea. Uh, they come back with uh, um, additional claims on, on like uh, uh, potential <coughs> percentages that they get in terms of their uh, capital that is lying around and claims, of course. Yeah? Um, the A380, that, that was a, a project type of the large uh, um, Airbus that some of you may have used already. Um, there, there was a massive delay because the parts get actually assembled in different localities. What, what gets Airbus? What gets uh, assembled in the UK? Does anybody know? The engines. 
Yeah, Engine is a good start, yeah. Who, who's doing Rolls that? Rolls-Royce. Yeah, Rolls-Royce. But uh, Airbus is as well in the UK. Where? They have their own football team, but this is kind of geeky. It's in the, in the fourth league, if you, if you look anywhere. Yeah, but, uh, um, okay, it's in, in, in Wales, yeah, we rebuilt the wings. This is pretty cool. Yeah? So, um, uh, wings made in the UK. And, uh, um, yeah, so, um, the, just the delay. Yeah, that, that was not even, like, anything, like, going wrong, but the delays with, like, promises, uh, um, delivery <coughs> times and all that, they have to pay the customers, yeah? So the customer want to, they, they make basically by their unit uh, uh, money, and they counted against it, uh, 6.4 billion. But Boeing helped us uh, uh, this year with an even more impressive one. There, there was a small incident. Luckily, nobody got seriously hurt. Actually, I have to make that. Uh, I just know that nobody got killed. But I uh, um, should be careful with the statement. But Boeing, basically, the 7 of them, uh, um, had a little bit uh, a problem with uh, failures of, of uh, actually the new um, equipment that they had fitted. It didn't really work out. And it came to 18.2 uh, billion. Uh, this is the cost of recalls and uh, basically uh, looking into it and uh, um, outfitting them. Yeah, so this is uh, um, quite horrendous. <laughs> what can go wrong with it? Yeah, this is on a budget level. Yeah, we, we still have to ask ourselves: Is it a success afterwards? Yeah, this is our project theorem on on which we get evaluated as project managers. Yeah, and then MOD Parliament. Yeah, the, the, the uh, actually, I don't want to just pick on them. This is really evil. So, but my favorite one was really, and I didn't even put the money against it because this was just priceless. They basically commissioned like a huge uh, a plane carrier ship, yeah, a, a massive ship. It was even here in the northeast. Yeah, it was uh, anchoring in North Shields. Yeah, f fabulous time. But uh, um, they decommissioned actually the planes before they were built. Yeah, so th this means you have this wonderful. Uh, uh, a uh, carrier that uh, literally has no uh, UK planes on it, but uh, okay. So um, this is how it can go. Uh, so um, pretty grim. So wh what do we do with this? Wh why do I even mention that? This is of course where we can draw very deep lessons from. Yeah? And uh, um, this is kind of the underlying notion. Um, that there was this famous uh, quote from NASA that, uh, what is a famous quote? Pardon? Uh, three to one. Oh, no, no, sorry. I, I, I wasn't thinking in percentages. I like that you did already the statistical risk analysis, how many projects fail. But what is the famous quote that uh, uh, was used or famous for NASA? Small stuff. The what? The small stuff. The small stuff. Yeah, from uh, gun, like small stuff for men. For, uh, oh, small, for yeah. Actually, this is probably the more famous one. You're, you're spot on. I, I was actually, failure is no option, yeah, but, uh, um, uh, okay, no, nobody knew this, but, okay, then the joke won't make any sense now. Uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, so the, there's actually a recent report written from uh, Hoffman and Kurt and, and those other and other guys, and uh, um, they, they are actually the project management office that sits as well in Columbia University, and uh, um, they, they actually have now written this new document, and it was just wonderful. Failure is an option, and, and uh, we, we hopefully learn out of it. And uh, th this is as well what I would encourage you to. This is where we shut down from all employers that see this talk. Um, I would encourage you to be brave enough and go out with your knowledge and understanding and do smart failure. Yeah, so what do I mean by that? You, you try something, it fails. Don't do the same again. Try something new. Yeah? Try again, fail again, <laughs> fail better. Yeah, okay, you, you maybe don't get the bonus for the project yet, yeah, but maybe free pizza. Yeah, you should really encourage this. Uh, um, I have a colleague, yeah, Eddie, who, who's actually uh, um, suggesting like options how you should be rewarded for it. Uh, watch it, it's an entertaining TED video, yeah? Eddie's smart failure. And uh, I'm a huge fan of this concept. Yeah? So in other words, we, we find solution and they may solve the problem but it's often not the right answer in the first place. Yeah, so there's iteration possible. Yeah? You know, the, about these budgets, obviously they've got such a huge uh, difference between the, the first budget and then when they finish the project, whether they've got this contingency or how they really get money for this. Where this money comes from to finish the project if they've got such a gap? 
Yeah, this is a good question, um, and I, I can give you an answer because now we have actually again this is uh, uh, another uh, professional that has specialized on projects to realize when they run over budget, what should we do? And this is a this is a new consultant. Yeah, this is quite hip at the moment, and he does IT. Well, he's focused on America to be fair, and he came to the uh, um, uh, to the UK. It was about stock market, and and they wanted to line them up with uh, faster cables and improve the performance, which would have meant that certain well, it had to do with algorithms in in, in a nutshell. And he did actually the evaluation. Should, should the taxpayer pay the additional two billion? Yeah, to but this wasn't yet the final budget. They knew this. They knew what to do for now, but there was probably to come more. And then he evaluated it for them, and uh, figured out that actually the two billion that they had spent, and that was budget, was already uh, um, gone. And to actually go on, they would have to spend four times the same. So you could actually make a very accurate prediction of that. And that meant that the government actually accepted one billion on top to actually close the project down and remove the infrastructure and actually make it a project failure. Yeah. So this is a new thing. In the past, what, what did you do in the spaghetti challenge when the spaghetti uh, tower was still wobbling and the time was running? What did you do with the resources? Did you evaluate? Maybe we should use the resources for the next spaghetti challenge. But what happened? No, you, you threw all the material in, yeah, the resources flew in, yeah, and this is exactly what happens here. And so, especially with prestige projects, and if you as a project manager lobby it, yeah, this is a very powerful thing, we come to that, project mediation, yeah, how do we interact with media, who do we communicate with, um, this is a very strong thing, yeah, so we, we are lobbying often for more money, yeah, look how much we have invested already. And as well, in Sydney's case, this was not really uh, an option for failure. This is as well why it took so long. They had to actually lobby in Parliament to pay more. It was a greed uh, frame already. But you, you see it even in recent projects. Yeah? The Olympics, this is quite interesting, more temporary one, started off with how much? Does anybody know how much the initial budget was? I, I take guesses. How much do you think it is, Olympics, in London? One hundred twenty billion. Hi, yeah, yeah, no, this is too high. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, the whole package. Yeah, this is actually pretty, 2.5 billion what, what the parliament accepted in 2005 to go ahead with the Olympics. How much did it cost? 7.5 7 before they even started. How much is it costing now? 13.8 at the moment. Yeah. So there, there is a strategic misrepresentation. Cynics say it's lying. I get bullied when I say lying, so I say strategic misrepresentation. People are more happy with that. Um, to actually get a bit. Yeah. How, how do these major projects always go so over budget by such a massive margin all the time? Yeah, the, the, there's a planning association that I don't want to involve now, but uh, um, the, 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 there's a game to this, and we, we come to that next week. When we start thinking about the life cycle at the conceptual and feasibility stage, there is an issue. If you are costing it accurately, you leave space for development, then the budget looks very ambiguous. And uh, um, think about it, the Olympics, yeah, tightly budgeted and like everything as bespoke, no technology advancement, 2.5 billion. But then, you know, you start doing it. Some sponsors jump in and say like, hey, we give you 100 million. Actually, did I give that much? Yeah, 100 million to, to write Coca-Cola over it. Oh, it was Powerade or something like that. Yeah. So, and uh, um, then they are like, oh, okay, we can update that. We, we fund that as well a little bit. And that is how where you have incentive-based uh, funding, basically, that, that comes in. And it grows it. And in reality, the idea is that it repays over time. They, they have made the case at some point for that. But it's often quite difficult to really quantify. The UK government has as well for that reason. Um, uh, we, we have a major project association in the UK, and they are advising. So, for example, on the Crossrail project, they were actually using a mathematical formula, which assumes that uh, um, you actually will arrive at 75% more of the initial planning costs. So this is just tailored in. You come up with your real planning cost, and they just like literally put 75% on top for evaluation. So this has a bad dynamic. Yeah? There are different reasons from major project to major project. Yeah? 
and, and some it's negotiated on grounds of uh, um, political means. Yeah, I don't want to say that there are certain fees involved along the way. And in other cases, it's unforeseen uh, um, issues with supply chain. Yeah, so uh, in a linear world, the supply chain exists. Yeah, then, uh, another example that I'm very familiar with, October, uh, um, when we uh, had in Berlin the um, new city center being built, Potsdamer Platz, uh, Berlin rented all the uh, train carriages for cement, all, in Europe. Yeah. Came from everywhere over Europe. This is just what nobody else can foresee. If you have your project and you want one uh, carriage uh, uh, filled with uh, cement, you know the pricing for it, this carriage is not there anymore. Yeah, so there, there are finite elements that are very difficult to forecast. This is when we come to the complexity uh, theorem yeah, of, of the environment. But uh, there, there are certain issues with that. We will work through it. But good question. Thank you. Have I kind of answered it a little bit? Yes, yeah, you have. Yeah, I have opened Pandora's box there. Yeah, so there, there's a lot more to it, it's actually. It's like a massive trend, though, isn't it, throughout time? Well, yeah, but we have as well a certain time. Yeah, so uh, people look for the cheapest available way of doing it. And then, you know, if you want to have the contract, there's as well a bidding implication. Yeah? <coughs> so um, there are certain issues with it. Dependency of, of project success. We, we are uh, running a little bit behind with the timing now, but uh, it's quite all right. Uh, I, I will um, just make it away by uh, summarizing the project success. We have different elements, yeah? so it depends on who is in charge in defining really what success means for you. So this can be the individual, it can be a team effort. In your case, in the project that we are doing together, it will be a team effort. The company, stakeholder expectations of quality, of course. Then as well, the context here again, we had them earlier, spatial dimensions, norms, like spatial is as well where you do it. Yeah? Do you have weather, do you have, normally we have weather, but you know, does it impact? norms chosen or, or put upon you. Uh, so this, there, there are different elements and we, we have many more. To, to actually divide success, uh, to just make you think, think a little bit about it, there's managing the team successful. Uh, this is having a great experience, like enjoying it in a way, uh, um, and then coming to success for, for everybody really. And, and successful management of a project, this is a different thing. Uh, this is achieving the, the goals and objectives. Now, it's very specific. It's like performing to budget, for example. Or if the budget changes, then you have to have a methodology, a project methodology, that kind of announces it at the beginning. Yeah? So it can be, for example, I've seen that uh, uh, I a lot of construct. Oh, Eurocopter is a wonderful example. They had a helicopter that could like fly on high mountains to, to bring people out that like kind of lost, uh, got lost in rock climbing and couldn't be flying, flown out. And they knew that they didn't have a system yet, so that was a development uh, uh, project for the rotor, yeah? because it's, it's like thin air and helicopters have certain issues at certain heights. And uh, they, they knew that that would cost something, so they didn't actually fit, uh, fix a budget to that element. Yeah? So um, with, with uh, basically shifting, for example, to parts, specific uh, uh, budgets, and performing within that remit and saying, like, okay, here we have a development budget, this can be a very powerful tool to still having the, the cost implications and performing to the delivery tools. Yeah? So it has as well to do with the scope, how you set it. Yeah? Um, then uh, achieving greater benefits for the project uh, uh, business or supply chain. Yeah, this is uh, um, actually benefits management. We, we have that in a separate uh, 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 lecture. And then uh, uh, achieving long-term strategic advantage with projects. Uh, yeah, I've separated it there, but it should be really together. And uh, creating prosperity and uh, visionary legacy with a project. Arguably the case example for that is the Olympics. But uh, I do always a test. Can I just ask, has anybody taken up an Olympic sport? Yes, one. No, but uh, is anybody doing an Olympic sport? Not, not on this level. Okay, a few. Yeah, so um, did you do it before as well? Yes? No, okay, you have really started. So in a way, sometimes it does work. Yeah, so um, the, the idea was as well that uh, uh, it's of course a media spectacle um, that, that actually brings people to sport and live a healthier life, arguably. Yeah, so, okay, but we, we come to that as well when we talk about major projects. 
So let's go one back. We know that success has largely to do with uh, stakeholder success and that we have to uh, manage this as well in a certain way and actually contextualize it. So how can we do this? But very quick, stakeholders, uh, um, this is actually um, a bad keyword. Stakeholders, when you go into a Google that hasn't been used by an academic like me, for, for me the first definition is actually the right one because I use it a lot. But uh, um, if you use it like on a neutral uh, account and you search it, uh, you will actually see that uh, it's, we have to look after our customers, our shareholders and our employees. Uh, this is actually taken from a business web page. But uh, um, then uh, a different view to this is uh, difficult to quantify, but it's really down to the question of how much your organization is trying to achieve in understanding, predicting, influencing what other people think and do. And that is actually quite informed. This is actually from the major project association. It's well based in Oxford. And there they have looked into that quite some, uh, some time. And uh, quite frankly, it depends a lot. Is, do, is anybody of you uh, in a company that is very customer or client oriented? Actually, what, what terminology do you use? Do you use customer or user, if yes? Customer, yeah, this is good. Anybody client oriented? Yeah, and quite client oriented. Do, do you do consultation as well, or, or okay? <coughs> Th this is good. Uh, I'm quite impressed. The, uh, the there's normally a divide. If if you call your client client, then you're often not very customer focused. Quite frankly. Uh, so there's a terminology implication as well, but we, we see now a shift. Uh, so it takes uh, um, uh, uh, slowly but surely its fruits. Uh, so in a way, we, we are going in the right direction. Okay. Um, in a nutshell, if I would have to define it, and I go very quickly through it, we, we actually work in the seminar in details through it. Um, stakeholders are individuals or groups that have in, an interest, are affected by project process or the outcomes. Um, I've listed a few, we do that in quite some detail. Why are they so important? Because most of the times those guys are responsible for the project failure. Not really, it's because we haven't really managed it to the expectations. Yeah? So their expectations were invisible <coughs> to us and we kind of run into it with the project. Yeah? Coming down to bad communication between relevant parties, uh, a lack of consensus, unclear objectives, insufficient senior management st uh, stakeholder support. Yeah, so especially if the, um, if the senior management or, or the company owner does deals that are not negotiated at project level, this can be very impacting. Yeah? Um, Peter Morris has put it a little bit different. Uh, uh, he basically pointed out that with stakeholders, we have to keep one thing in mind. Most projects are implemented by people, and when people become involved, perception, communication, agenda, power, and a whole raft of similar issues come into play and begin to change the design, regularity, and controlled intent of managers. Yeah? And uh, this is very true. Um, you, you, we will actually explore that later on again in the seminar yeah, with our ex own expectations and see how we can negotiate uh, them easily. I have as well regarding questions for this. This is really, uh, um, this is a famous name of uh, Flüberg, or, or, or Flyberg, as my uh, friends uh, uh, like to call him. And uh, um, he has actually done work uh, for the World Bank. Um, they have analyzed a whole raft of past projects from the World Bank and went basically in to, to look how can we actually uh, identify stakeholders. And they did certainly this from a risk point. Now, I've worked myself on a World Bank project, and I can tell you, there, there comes a point where it disconnects. You're, you're just basically managing risk. You don't do the proper uh, stakeholder consultation with discovering expectations with it. But nonetheless, good paper, and uh, he actually describes it as well, to be fair. So um, uh, worthwhile having a look at. Uh, I won't read them out. But to be a little bit more pragmatic, um, the, rec uh, um, the recommendation in literature certainly is to divide the stakeholders in a core team. Yeah? So those are uh, sourced for expectations, core externals. Those are potentially the client that gives you an input, yeah? key for success, but maybe passive. 
And then you have the rest uh, worthwhile to inform, especially if it's a project where publicity could help you, yeah? potentially getting more funding, for example, if you, if you have like a, a tight budget. Yeah? Oh, sorry. Making con uh, a success concrete, I, I mentioned it already uh, uh, before, De Witt, he's still a professor, and uh, he basically claimed uh, um, it can't be really done, and if carried out, what purpose does it serve? Yeah, so it was the notion that there is a huge uh, um, fluctuating element to it. But we can, uh, of course, do so with our tools to a certain degree. And uh, it's uh, the project management success, how to plan, how to manage and deliver the project on time and budget, and uh, added, of course, uh, the quality, scope, and standards, compliance, and requirements that we have. Yeah, we, we do that later on in, in a lot of detail. Uh, along that, I, I wanted to mention the project success criteria, because this is what we are going to uh, use. And project uh, uh, success criteria, or in different literature, also called key result area or critical success factors, um, are really a motivation tool for us as project managers and our project team because we can achieve them and we can leave them behind us and we can see how we're actually progressing. Yeah, so never to under-evaluate and uh, best defined really by SMARTER. It's a tool but I will go in a lot more detail with techniques and tools that are alternatively around. Uh, smarter, um, the, the last A is really coming from a past student. In 2009, there was a, a student from Chalmers who shouted in the back, and the most important is it's agreed. So uh, Smarter stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time limited. And yeah, thanks to him, uh, it's now as well agreed. Uh, there were some other elements as well added to this. Yeah? Um, project success criteria uh, can be as well measured in so-called key performance indicators. I think this is what we use quite a bit in the UK. Who has come across KPIs? Okay, quite a few. Oh, not, not so many from the UK. Internationally, we use a lot of KPIs, I, I think. Yeah, so um, it's uh, normally largely agreed values by which performance and activities can be periodically and continuously measured. So you go back where the project is processing through the life cycle. Yeah, this is a very powerful tool. Um, yeah, additional uh, um, notions uh, um, that have been of interest is uh, probably uh, um, other evaluation tools for, for success in itself. And we, we evaluate often as well success on benchmarking. Yeah, this is a little bit what you had with me in the spaghetti challenge. Yeah? We were benchmarking the height within the competition against each other. Yeah? Then other ones are actually specifications. And uh, more recently, I see uh, uh, the game layer. Yeah? So when you don't have resources with game layers, it's, a, it's kind of a, yeah, you, you can get hooked into it. Uh, um, there's a TED talk to this as well. Uh, says claims that uh, if you use uh, seven game layers, you can manipulate uh, into everybody into doing whatever he wants uh, or whatever you want. So it's a dangerous tool. Use it with caution, and uh, uh, but worthwhile uh, checking out probably on the TED talk. Okay, let me uh, um, actually do one last case study to to settle a little bit in where where success can go wrong. Yeah. And that, that was really the wonderful ca uh, case of the Large Hadrian Collider. Does, ever, does anybody know what that is? What is a Large Hadrian Collider? Switzerland. Yeah. Switzerland, France, a little bit under Germany, but doesn't come to the top, so it doesn't really count. Yeah? And it, it's literally to, to shoot like uh, um, elements of particles onto each other with nearly light speed. Yeah, so you, you like send one with nearly light speed this direction and the other one this direction and then you crash them yeah? and then you look what happens. And uh, it, it's done in a facility uh, um, that does higher energy physics and uh, um, there was a news media uh, uh, man who actually looked into that and he said like, oh yeah, this is energy particles that are the same mass like the sun. This is crazy. Why would we want the sun on our planet? And then uh, uh, there, there were like beautiful uh, um, uh, notes coming out uh, uh, in the news, yeah? uh, in the newspaper. CERN will produce potentially a black hole and eat up the planet Earth. Yeah? Uh, and may destroy the world. That, that was another notion. Um, this was actually quite interesting to see because they are mostly uh, physicians 
and they don't really advertise. They're not proper project managers. They're, they advertise, but in very targeted media elements. They target to other university professors, to students, to companies that are interested in that area. But they certainly weren't moved before into the mainstream light in that sense. And what was quite interesting was the to core team or, or core externals they didn't even see that as an issue to, to produce a black hole. They didn't even see an issue with it because they work with this notion quite a bit. Yeah, but the, then what was worse is um, they didn't really take that serious. So the senior pros, uh, press officer pointed out that test runs had been successful and the world hasn't been destroyed yet. Yeah? So th this was literally the, the, the quote. Uh, I should have really quoted it. And then uh, leading scientists pointed out it's quite hard to destroy the Earth. So they, they took it quite ironic. And uh, um, now we, we have discovered kind of the uh, bosom uh, uh, Higgs particle, or, or the, the, the particle that was described by uh, Higgs. Um, and uh, uh, the rhetoric has dumbed down a little bit, yeah, or numbed down, not uh, dumbed down, but uh, um, certainly the concerns have been gone. Uh, this costs them quite a lot of additional money. Yeah? We, we have now side effects. Who knows Brian Cox? A few? Yeah, he's a professor in uh, physics, and he's lobbying non-stop on BBC, yeah? National Television for Science, for Understanding. This is a direct result of this, this happening. Yeah? Before he was not like in the media, he was actually a physics professor. Now he's involved in media. Yeah? So projects have their own spin. Be aware on the areas that you're actually playing in. Yeah, this doesn't necessarily happen to every project team, but uh, I would say huge project success. Some people would describe that again under the um, iron triangle with budget versus quality versus uh, um, the timing as a failure. Yeah? So that is a game that we are playing. More, more in the seminar. Any questions at that point? Okay, still a little bit vague. We will make this vagueness go away in the seminar and uh, uh, build our own project. Yeah? If you have questions, just come to me. Yeah. I'm actually here, I've got to go home on Friday, so that means I miss, I miss a seminar. I'm concerned that I'm going to be missing out on really vital information. I just wanted to know what I could look at or for. Uh, it's uploaded, but uh, you, you have to... Um, is, is it really detrimental that I miss? Uh, in a I way, we, we do like a workshop with your team. So um, th this is kind of bad, but um, you, you can just have you uh, worked through the seminar notes that I gave you. Yeah, I've been going through them little bits by bits. I've been meeting with my team and we're like, obviously, because we've got to do a presentation on Monday, which I'm not going to be here for either. So I'm coming back on Wednesday, you see, because I've got a family issue. But yeah, we're it's quite all right, but uh, uh, just make sure that they address it and that they incorporate your notes. <clears throat> yeah, we know, we've, we've got a Facebook group and we've been talking to each other. We know a little bit okay. about each other. As long as you like keep that. the communication up, this is absolutely yeah, so fine. So there's nothing you'd like me to look into for Friday.